This is CBC Here and Now. There's nothing wrong with the George Street Festival. There's nothing wrong with other events that are going to happen. What was wrong was not all the protocols appeared to be in place or followed at least. And so we need to ensure that we follow those for future events. So what should happen instead? The festival carries on, but one St. John City Councillor has some feedback for the George Street Festival. Another fall like day today. However, humidity returns tomorrow, as does the risk of thunderstorms. We got to take a look at the new Paradise Intermediate, but not just that, ask a few questions about the back to school plan. That's coming up on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Jeremy Eat. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. We start tonight with a St. John City Councillor who says he's shocked by the crowds he's seeing on George Street. Videos and photos from the George Street Festival are raising questions and concerns over COVID safety. Now the festival kicked off last week and continues into tomorrow. These images may feel almost jarring to see after more than a year and a half of masking and physical distancing, a shoulder to shoulder Older crowd cheering and singing in downtown St. John's. City Councilor Sean Skinner was involved with organizing the event and says this isn't what he envisioned. Well, it was certainly a little bit shocking. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, to see people without masks. The crowd itself, uh, I anticipated there would be people at the event and that it will be successful, but I expected we would see people because of the lack of social distancing. Uh, weary masks and uh, and they didn't and and so yeah it was a bit shocking to see that and so was that the shocking part for you the fact that people weren't wearing masks or were there other safety protocols that you felt should have been put in place well the, the protocols were put in place the provincial government approved the COVID plan that the George Street Association had the the city is responsible for things like fire and access and egress and making sure the structures are safe and those kinds of things but the COVID or pandemic type things are the responsibility of the province. It was my understanding that uh, there were things that the George Street Association had implemented that were to be followed. And that meant people entering by certain gates based upon their ticket. It meant that people were to be in, in uh, sections. They had different sections. Some people couldn't mingle throughout the whole of George Street. Once you went into your section, you would stay there. And people would be encouraged to wear masks. But I didn't see that. I didn't hear that, and I'm not sure if that was done. And I'm interested in this idea about encouraging mask wearing because the mask mandate has been dropped. Um, should we really be giving people the option uh, to wear a mask under these kinds of circumstances where people are outdoors enjoying beverages, probably feeling a little bit less inhibited than normal? Um, is it realistic to think that people would wear masks and keep distance in that situation, do you think? But in an event like this, where people are so close together, it was my understanding that they would be encouraged to wear masks. They would be asked to wear masks. And if people decided not to do that, well, I guess that's their, their prerogative. It's not mandated by the province, but the province has the authority to mandate that and the province has the authority to enforce that. So I think they're the ones that need to really step up here and ask the George Street Association uh, what happened and how it happened and what they're gonna do in the future. This was the first big event that we had and it's really important that it be done properly for you know future events and and i don't want this to reflect negatively on potential to do other things and so let's talk about how we can make it better and make it safer for people and allow people to be able to have those kinds of events there's nothing wrong with the george street festival there's nothing wrong with other events that are going to happen what was wrong was not all the protocols appeared to be in place or followed at least and so we need to ensure that we follow those for future events. So let's talk about how we're going to do that and make it safe for everybody. And we did try to speak with the province about the situation, but received a statement instead of an interview. The health department writes that the images of the crowd are concerning, but notes the event is outdoors and vaccination rates are high. It also says there have been no formal complaints related to this year's George Street Festival and that it encouraged organizers to encourage festival goers to wear masks. Now, we also reached out to the George Street Association who declined CBC's requests for an interview 
you earlier today, last night, they did issue a statement which read in part, the George Street Association continues to prioritize social safety. The association said there is a decreased capacity from previous years that it has upped the number of security and staff and has encouraged mask wearing and encouraged guests to be fully vaccinated. It also says for the remaining nights, we will remind all guests of the opportunities available to maintain a socially safe experience. Well, temperatures today certainly feeling fall like out there pretty much across the board. 14 degrees was all we reached in St. John's today. 13 in Twillingate, 15 in Badger and those temperatures towards uh, Labrador as well. Not much warmer than that. Eight degrees, in fact, uh, for Nain today. Now, if you're wondering where all that humidity has been, well, we said goodbye to it for a little bit, but it is going to make a return. Certainly tomorrow we're going to see some muggy conditions for parts of the province, mostly the island, and then uh, uh, as we get into Friday, this is when we're going to see that muggy, more humid air return, and that's thanks to the tropical moisture that we're going to see uh, out ahead of the remnants of Ida. So we'll see that uh, work its way towards the maritime provinces on uh, Thursday and then eventually uh, make its way towards the island as we get into Friday. It's going to bring lots of rain with it. It looks like at this point even some windy conditions as well, but I'll get into all the details when I come back. Believe it or not, but this time next week, students will be one sleep away from the first day of school. In Paradise, about 375 students will be walking through the doors of a brand new building. Here now, Enrique Wilhelm got a tour today, as well as an update on the province's back-to-school strategy. The new Paradise Intermediate, still empty and quiet, but not for much longer. For now, back to school in the province will begin, this year with full-size in-person classes. The school districts and administrators, the schools themselves have experienced the lived experience of dealing with the high-risk situation last year, so we can pivot very quickly if and when needed. Uh, what determines when and if we pivot is entirely based on guidance from public health. There are measures like additional uh, mask wearing, for example, or some protocols uh, with respect to transportation or just flow in the school, traffic flow in the school, that would be introduced first. Uh, the most drastic means would be full uh, virtual learning. Uh, we don't anticipate that occurring early on. The back-to-school plan drew criticism earlier this month. Masks are encouraged but not mandatory in school and on the bus. No physical distancing, buses will be back to full capacity and field trips have gotten the green light. Meanwhile, all other Atlantic provinces say students must wear masks both in school and aboard the bus. We take our guidance from public health. They have guided us exceptionally well through the pandemic. Uh, this province has done better than uh, most jurisdictions across uh, Canada and certainly uh, many jurisdictions globally. Uh, we've done very well in terms of vaccines. We're in better shape this time this year than we were this time last year. Another concern, ventilation. 4,000 air filters have been ordered and will be installed in the province's more than 250 schools before or shortly after September 8th. Priority will be given to K-6 to and to schools without HVAC systems. We've got about one-third of our infrastructure currently with HVAC. Uh, the other two-thirds, uh, we are you know, traditional structures. So priority will go there, but ultimately the aim is to have a device in all of our classrooms, regardless of HVAC or, or not. There's about you know, 5,100 full-time teaching positions. Now, they don't all equate to classrooms. But uh, we've got 4,000 on the initial order and, and yesterday a subsequent order for another 1,500. A recent spike in COVID cases has caused concerns for parents, but Minister Osborne says he follows the recommendations of public health and sticks with the initial back-to-school plan. Henrike Wilhelm, CBC News, Paradise. Well, the campaign for one candidate running in the St. John's municipal election has taken a disturbing turn. Ophelia Ravencroft, who's running in Ward 2, says she's experienced sustained and serious harassment over her gender identity that has gotten way out of hand. Here now's Meg Roberts has been following the story and has more. Death threats, 
That's the type of harassment Ophelia Ravencroft says she's had to endure while campaigning for the upcoming municipal election. Now her campaign team is speaking out, sharing that graphic threats have been made towards Ravencroft as well as others in the transgender community. This is not something that anyone should be exposed to merely by virtue of the fact that they put themselves out in a, in a visible way. This is wildly unacceptable. So it's, it's made me pretty emotional, but it's, uh, it hasn't stripped away my resolve. Ravencroft says her campaign hasn't been as vibrant. Her team isn't doing any door-to-door -door canvassing, and they've been slower to get signs up to avoid incitement. Equal Voice NL is an organization focused on training women and diverse populations in Canadian politics. Know that everything that you are and all that you bring to the table is already good enough. You are a leader if you are invested in the community and you want better for the community. What I ask for the community at large is when you see this form of harassment or this kind of hatred, to call it out when you see it and to educate the, the community at large, your children, on the importance of having those diverse perspectives or lived experiences in leadership positions. In a statement, St. John's Mayor Danny Breen said the harassment that is being experienced by Ophelia Ravencroft is completely unacceptable. The public should have the utmost respect for all candidates who are putting their names forward in the election. It's important to democracy and it's important for community. We need people to run for council and they should feel safe in doing so. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary says it's investigating. And despite everything, Ravencroft says she's not backing out. As disconcerting and upsetting as it's been, it's something that I made a decision to myself, with myself early on that it's something I would confront and I wouldn't let it make me bow out. The folks doing this are not going to win. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Now sticking with that election, just over an hour ago, the City of St. John's released news about that upcoming municipal election next month. With the call for nominations officially over, three seats have been won by acclamation. Mayor Danny Breen, Deputy Mayor Sheila O'Leary, and Councillor Ian Froud of Ward 4. Now, those three seats were uncontested during the nomination. Now, the official candidate list for all remaining St. John's seats will be released on Thursday. Well, police expect to see the Outlaws Motorcycle Club cruising around parts of the island this week. The RCMP says the club will likely pop in at Central starting tomorrow through to the Labor Day weekend. While the majority of riders are law-abiding citizens, the RCMP says the Outlaws identify as a 1% club. The 1% symbol can be seen as a patch pin or tattoo. Now, police say the gangs can create unsafe traffic conditions when riding in formation, blocking intersections, and gathering along the highway. They're warning the public not to engage with members of the outlaws and to report any sightings. Staying on the roads, forestry officials are warning people to be vigilant. That's because September and October are the months when moose become more active during rutting season. The department says drivers should watch for roaming moose, particularly between dusk and dawn. As temperatures keep cooling down, the animals are more likely to roam. So you've heard of a senior prom, but how about a senior's prom? It happened last week at Bishop's Gardens. Now that's a senior living facility in St. John's built on the site of a former high school, Bishop's College. Now some residents are actually former students, including one man who's making up for missing the big day back in the day. Here and now's Zach Gowdy takes you there. <music> is special right prom night just in its essence is special we're a school you know we redid the school and so it has that tie-in but it's just that opportunity to get a bit gussied up do a little bit extra and have some celebration and so everybody's just kind of gotten right on board with it Beautiful. <laughs> We're going to have a prom night at Bishop Gardens. And we got a hair all done. And we're going for a bus ride after dinner. And then we're going to have music. And we got to dress up in our long dresses. And oh, I'm telling you, it's like when we are 16 years old or 17. Everybody looks good. <laughs> I'm probably going to wear jeans and a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> now they gave me a dress, but I don't know if it's going to fit. I haven't tried it on. As you get older, you, you, if you didn't have something to take your interest, 
I mean, it's easy enough to stay in your room and do nothing. And uh, nobody wants to do that, really. The buzz today is unbelievable. There's just such positive, everybody's talking about, oh, I'm gonna get my hair done, I'll get my nails done, and we're gonna go on the bus ride, and what dress are you wearing, and do you have this? Can I borrow a tie? Can I borrow a jacket? And so I had staff come to me today who said, now I'm off early, can I come back? So Bishop's College was a high school, and it was here, built, I think, around the 40s, added onto in the 60s, and operated right into the 2000s. So it's been really fun to bring that little piece of Bishop's College into Bishop's Garden Seniors Living. That's me there. My name is Edwin Richards. I was a former student at Bishop's College between 1969 in 71. I missed my prom because I was working at the uh, UIC in St. John's, the Unemployment Insurance Commission, and a few weeks later I was on unemployment myself. What does it mean to you to get to relive the prom tonight that you never got to go to all those years ago? Well, I'll get a chance to dance with all the women. I think it's uh, really great because it's going to bring back memories of uh, that I missed. I graduated from Bishop's College in 66. Did you go to your prom here when you were a student? I did. I went with my husband. Oh, it was nice. We had a, a live band, and all the graduates were there, and we danced all night. I think the curfew was 11 o'clock. Like, I can see myself and my husband walking in here so many years ago. What does it mean for you guys to see such a buzz and to see everybody's faces lit up? Well, it's what we worked for, right? It's what we were here for. It's what we purposed to do. And so now we're seeing it come to life, and that's just exciting. This has been a roller coaster of a competition. So, I mean, just taking it in strides and just looking to the next thing now. Roller coaster to say the least, and the next thing is tonight's swim. We will hear more from Katarina Roxon poolside from the Tokyo Paralympics. Well, the rain drizzle and fog has moved back in. Uh, we're looking at a little bit of a warm up this week. Uh, also, the risk of some thunderstorms for parts of the island. We'll get into all those details when we come back.
It was a bit of a disappointing swim for Katarina Roxon in the 100 meter freestyle event late last night. The Kippen swimmer failed to advance to the finals in the event, but she's not done yet. Now, after her swim, she spoke with CBC Sports about the race, training for the Paralympics during a pandemic, and if the 28 year old might have a fifth games left in her. Katarina Roxon will swim for Canada. I wanted to go a lot quicker than that. Uh, it was a struggle for sure. I don't know, this this has been a roller coaster of a competition. So I mean just taking it in strides and just looking to the next thing now. So it's done, it's over with in the past. Time to move on. Katarina Roxon on the right, Aurélie Rad standing at the back. Great Britain will be disqualified from this final for the Canadians. It's a, a happy result. Like this meet, it was a roller coaster. I mean, so many high moments, so many low moments, lots of closures, lots of training alone, lots of adapting and making a training session. Like, it was just a lot. It was so, so different. It wasn't definitely wasn't the prep that I think everyone was hoping for going into these games. Um, that definitely played a part in it. And, you know, when the day comes, I'm... You're either ready or you're not, and you know, today I just wasn't ready. The bronze medalists were Canada. I think Canada is doing amazing, absolutely amazing, and I think our next gen is, is awesome, and they're really pushing and coming up. So I think Canada has a great future in this, especially for the next game. So for me, I have no idea what my next plans are. I'm just getting through this meet first, and then I'll decide. Canada are the bronze medalists. Now, as I said earlier, Roxon will be back in the pool tonight. That's at 10.30 p.m. on the island, 10 o'clock in most of Labrador. She's competing in the 200 individual, individual medley relay race. Ah, oh, man, individual medley race. So that's the one where they do all four strokes in one race. <laughs> My name is Sadie. I live in Torbay, Newfoundland. And I'm going to kindergarten. I wonder who my teacher is. <laughs> and I wonder what my classroom looks like. I wonder. <laughs> my name is Kelly Morphy. I'm excited to go to school to meet my friend. My name is Beckham Bowers. I live in Hollywood. I'm sorry about uh, I'm going on the gold bus my first time. Oh my goodness, <laughs> so adorable. Thank you for sending us your back to school messages and just eight more sleeps before school. Yep, and of course there's still time to get your message in and the email address is nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yeah, so keep them coming. <laughs> Seems like a major theme is getting to ride the school bus for the first time. Yeah, <laughs> seeing their friends. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, time for a look at the weather. It was pretty chilly this morning. I had to layer up when I was out for a little hike uh, in the early in the morning, but the humidity is coming back. That's right, yes. The first time I actually put on pants to walk Drizzle this morning. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, hey, there you I go. I had multiple layers on. Yeah, early yeah. in the morning, get those chilly temperatures. But uh, yes, humidity is returning. We're gonna see a wind shift, and that's why that will happen. Let's take a look at what's happening right now. We've got an area of low pressure to the just west of Labrador, and then uh, another area of low pressure to the south of the island right now. That is that counterclockwise rotation, which is why we're seeing that easterly flow for uh, parts of the island and why we're seeing some of those cooler temperatures as well. Starting to lose that daylight with a visible satellite, but we can see more texture in the cloud cover. So even though we don't have uh, the radar on the west coast and the northern peninsula, there does look like there's some showers working their way through. Otherwise, not a whole lot on the go. Uh, some heavier showers up across Labrador, and that will generally be the story uh, as we head through the evening hours tonight. And your temperatures aren't really going to move too much from what we're seeing right now. So current temperatures anywhere from 13 to 18 degrees, a little cooler for the northern peninsula and then cooler up across Labrador as well. Lab City uh, sitting around 16 degrees right now. So we will see those sh the showers potentially uh, as well as fog 
Andrews will stick around for most of the island as we get into the overnight hours tonight. Uh, and then that rain will work its way across Labrador as well. Uh, looking at a solid five, maybe 10 millimeters of rain possible for central areas towards the west as well. Uh, otherwise, just drizzle and showers uh, towards coastal areas of the uh, big land. And tonight, those temperatures, like I said, not moving too much. That's where you should be sitting tonight. Light winds or the winds easing uh, overnight, and they're going to stay a little bit breezy up to the north, though, out of the northeast, about 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. You're looking at single digit lows tonight, uh, otherwise double digits for both Happy Valley, Goose Bay and uh, Lab City at uh, overnight tonight. So tomorrow. Not a whole lot different uh, as far as those unsettled conditions as that area of low pressure continues to uh, affect most of the province. Now we will see that change in humidity tomorrow afternoon. And then uh, as the afternoon rolls around, we could see a few peaks of sun through central, but it does look like some thunderstorms will likely develop uh, for the west coast through central. And then even uh, further towards the Bonavista Peninsula, we may see a few uh, thunderstorms roll through as well. And then showers the story again across the big land. As we get into the evening hours, we may see a little bit more clearing skies down along the south coast, but that at this point, that's about it. So here's where that risk of thunderstorms is for tomorrow. Again, from the west coast through to Bonavista Peninsula, I kept in the eastern or western portion of the Avalon. We may see a few thunderstorms, but, but uh, overall it is just looking like showers for the afternoon for most of the Avalon. 20 degrees will be the afternoon high in St. John's. Those winds generally light southeasterly is about uh, 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. Humidex values though, feeling closer to the mid to uh, high 20s through the afternoon. A little bit warmer as we head towards Clarenville, 25 degrees will be your afternoon high. And you're looking at a similar temperature forecast towards central as well. Grand Falls, Windsor, 23 degrees. Now, like I said, you could see the sun peak out a few uh, early afternoon, but then that risk of thunderstorms will roll through. Uh, West Coast, you're looking at temperatures around 17 to 20 degrees is your daytime highs. Not a whole lot of wind to speak of, just about 5 to 10 kilometer per hour winds. Cooler for the northern peninsula, you're only looking at highs in and around 11 uh, degrees and then similar forecast for Labrador as well. Uh, Lab City sitting around uh, 11 degrees and your winds will be out of the east about 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. So I mentioned this yesterday. We're still watching the remnants of Tropical Storm Ida. Uh, it is going to head towards the maritime provinces as we get into Thursday as uh, a low pressure system. Now, sometimes when we start to see them transition to extra tropical, they do strengthen and it does look like that is what's going to happen. It'll bring some periods of rain by the time we get into Thursday night and then Friday for parts of the West Coast and then continue uh, for most of the afternoon. Looks like it'll bring some pretty uh, heavy rainfall at this point, but I'll get into those details, have a little bit more of that when I come back.
As we draw closer to the Labor Day weekend, many employers in the service and hospitality industry are still hiring. While COVID restrictions are easing, businesses are hustling to recruit staff. Now, the labor shortage is not unique to Newfoundland and Labrador, but given the scale of the province's service industry, employers here are facing some unique challenges. Chrissy Holmes has been looking into that part of this complex story, and she joins us now. Chrissy, you've been speaking with a number of business owners and managers, you know, the people who do the hiring. What have you been hearing? Well, Jeremy, the long and the short of it is this. There are lots of jobs available and not enough people who want to fill them. Job ad websites are full of positions now, hundreds of them, in fact, everything from line cooks to housekeeping staff to restaurant managers to bartenders, the list goes on. Now, these are jobs that were once filled. Now, just consider this. Accommodation and food services were, of course, the hardest hit industries in the pandemic. These workers availed of more CERB payments than any other sector. So in 2020, nearly two thirds, that's over 66% of all hospitality and service workers in Canada received CERB payments. But even with things reopening, those workers aren't all coming back. It's been a busy season and with fewer bodies, it's all hands on deck and that includes owners and managers. So I wanted to know what is going on right at the hiring line. So I spoke with three bosses, Kathy Lomond, the owner of Hotel Porta Basque, Jeremy Bonia, the owner of the Merchant Tavern and Greg Fleming, the general manager of the Alt Hotel. Now, Fleming told me that one of the bottlenecks he's feeling is with housekeeping, not enough staff there. They also wanted to expand their dining space outdoors. So they did something a little unprecedented to find workers. Get this, in the middle of summer, they held a job fair because the old fashioned interview process just wasn't working. What is more noticeable now is that where you will schedule an interview and typically you would have a variety, a number of different candidates. Uh, for a position or positions, uh, in some cases nobody does, sh nobody shows, and if or you would get two of say eight, those types of situations. So your options could be very limited. You might have to go back to the drawing board, and it is a unfortunately, I guess, a waste of time or certainly a, uh, a challenge that uh, can be frustrating for sure. And Greg Fleming isn't alone on that front. Just take a listen to this. Well, there were about five or six resumes that did come in and two of those add uh, jobs in other places. So I ended up interviewing one person of which I Irish. 10 years ago, you'd get 20 or 25 applications. Even five years ago, you probably would have gotten at least 10 to 12. I've heard of businesses trying to open, reopen and having nobody and having six interviews and one person show up. We are one of the biggest employers of youth and uh, younger people. So they're just not out there to hire. I tell you, if you're a young person looking to work right now, there's no shortage of places you can go. Now just think about this. In St. John's, for example, many post-secondary students were studying virtually this year. So that meant less of them had to physically be in the city. So that is one factor, but it's not the only one. One pool of talent that we would turn to would be immigration. I feel like uh, those, that area has been less. For some of my employees who need to get work uh, to qualify for EI, they just couldn't wait the term out. And uh, so some of them just left and, you know, look for other opportunities. COVID, there's a number of people who still aren't really comfortable going out and don't really want to go back to the workplace. Our customers are pretty transient, coming from all parts of Canada. So that was a little bit of concern. We're seeing a lot of, you know, professionals work from home, office setups. And, you know, we have a, a diminishing population. We have an aging population and a lot less, you know, young people out there seeking work. We also have the CERB payments going out as well. So there's a lot of people sort of who are motivated not to work. They're, they're getting paid to stay home. Now, Chrissy, I know that people want to hear more about the CERB effect, but let's get back to that in a moment. First, let's face it, money talks. What incentives are employers offering to attract workers? Well, that part is really interesting, Jeremy. Alt, for example, is part of a larger hotel chain, which is really focused on recruitment right now. And of course, has more resources to do so. But of course, not every business does. 
don't have any wiggle room. We are absolutely still in a survival mode. For us, we were shut down. There was zero revenue coming in when normally there'd be something. You're still paying rents, you're still paying utilities, you're still paying all those extra things. So that just, just accumulates debt. So now there's a lot more owners carrying a lot of debt with them and now trying to recover from that. We are, you know, in an industry where we don't see a lot of profits anyway. And no doubt, you know, if it wasn't for Sue's, you know, the, the wage subsidy, most of us would not be open. Chrissy, do these employers have any theories about the role that CERB may play in this current labor shortage? Uh, yes. Uh, now, I spoke with the owner of one business who would not go on camera. Now, they told me that they've actually had people show up to do interviews and ask for written confirmation that they were, in fact, seeking a job in order to extend their benefits. In fact, I actually heard that more than once. And it turns out the employers I spoke with did as well. I have heard, heard cases of that. I do hear that in certain circles. I have heard people say that they're supposed to ensure or confirm that they're looking for work. I've not been asked, you know, can you give me a letter saying that I was here looking for work? Yeah, no, we've been, we've been very fortunate not to come across those people yet. Because I'm like, oh, you're here looking for work. I work for you. <laughs> it has been mentioned as one of many, and I will stress many op uh, possibilities of what is, ha I'd say ultimately, this industry was the hardest hit, arguably, and as many are saying and prognosticating, that it will be the, one of the slowest, if not the slowest, to recover. Now, the federal assistance timeline has been extended into October after the election, which, of course, coincides with the time when tourism is expected to cool down. Many employers were guarded when I asked them about what they think the fix is, but Jeremy Bonia did say this. Nothing's going to change until after the election. Um, no one's going to pull the plug on CERB yet. Unemployment rates, you know, might look like they're skyrocketing, but that's not the case. It's, it's just a lack of actual labor. We have a labor shortage issue right now across the country. So most employers agree that there is no one size fits all answer. The question that remains, though, is where are the workers? A little later this week, I'll be diving deeper into that part of the story to see what the numbers say. Live from the newsroom, I'm Chrissy Holmes for here and now.
their first day. That's what today is. Kindergarten. Kindergarten. Calling all kindergartners. Here and Now is looking for kids who are heading off on their first day of school ever. Ask mom or dad to grab their phone and take a video of you. Tell us your name, where you're from, and why you're excited about starting school. It's a day for kindergarten. Then email that video to nlphotos at cbc.ca and you could be on TV before the first bell rings. Money has been a theme for day 17 of the federal election campaign. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole laid out his party's overall plan to get Canada's economy growing and end pandemic relief programs. We will replace them with our job search, which will provide an incentive for companies to hire. And we will make targeted investments in stimulus measures, including investing in infrastructure projects, to help create jobs and make our communities better places to live. O'Toole bashed Justin Trudeau over the Liberal government's spending, saying at the current rate the federal debt will triple in the next four years. O'Toole promised to balance the budget over the next 10 years. A Liberal government will invest almost $6.5 billion for mental health services across the country. And we'll make this investment through a brand new, dedicated Canada mental health transfer to provinces and territories. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau was discussing his party's platform on mental health. The Liberals appear to be countering what the Conservatives announced last week. Trudeau also pledged to create a national three-digit hotline for suicide prevention and mental health support. Very wealthy investors are using the housing market like a stock market. And we want to tackle that. We want to get big money out of housing. So if someone here in Port Moody Coquitlam is looking to buy their home, they shouldn't have to compete with people with deep pockets that are gaming the housing market like a stock market. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was back in BC and expanding on his party's housing policy. The New Democrats say they'll reinstate a 75% capital gains tax on the sale of second residences or non-primary homes to discourage property flipping. Singh also pledged to tackle money laundering that takes place throughout the real estate market. Canada has a relatively small population given its size, but we are uh, the sixth largest importer of food uh, and the number one uh, per capita food importer, importer in the world. Green Party leader Anami Paul says Canada's reliance on imported food represents a national security threat. She wants to replace one-third of Canada's food imports with domestic production. Paul says it would encourage economic diversity and rural redevelopment. Well, Bloc Québécois leader Yves-Francois Blanchet calling on the other federal party leaders to support Quebec's secularism law, Bill 21. It bans most public employees from wearing overt religious symbols. Blanchet wants the other leaders to state that they will respect Quebec's choice in passing the bill and ensure that no public money will be used to fund legal challenges to the bill. Well, returning now to the Paralympic Games, Canada added to its metal hardware today. Devin Haru has more on the track performance that put a Canadian on the podium. As the sun began to set on day seven of competition here at the Tokyo 2020 Paralympics, it looked as though Team Canada might not win a medal for the first time in competition. But then magic unfolded inside National Stadium. Right behind me is 20-year-old Zachary Gingras of Markham, Ontario, took to the track, making his Olympic final debut in the men's T38 400-meter race. You could feel the tension inside the stadium as he got into the starting blocks, shot off the beginning of the race, and came charging down the stretch. A personal best time of 50.85, good enough for a bronze medal, his first Paralympic medal. What a journey it's been for Zingra, who trains out of Victoria, BC. He loved basketball, wanted to play basketball in high school, but made the switch 
to running. And it's a good thing he did because he's Canada's latest medalist at the Paralympic Games. Team Canada now has 13 medals here at the Paralympics. Devin Haru for CBC Sports in Tokyo. That Devin Haru is a man of many hats. <laughs> Now, we're all trying to navigate how to best mark special moments during the pandemic. So travel restrictions may have inspired many people to get creative. Yes, for one groom in Toronto, it was finding a way to bring his bride's best friend across the Atlantic for their wedding. The CBC's Talia Ritchie has more on how one bridesmaid beamed in. I'd like to introduce you to one of Britney's bridesmaids from London, Sarah Redding. Ring, ring. London calling. This Toronto bride had a feeling there was a surprise in store on her wedding day. But a hologram appearance from her best friend was certainly not what she expected. Did you really feel like when that was happening that you were living in the future? Yes. Well, my aunts actually said that they <laughs> felt that they were on Star Trek. Thank you, Jeff. Husband of the year. Art Media is the company behind the technology. We capture people in one part of the world and we beam them anywhere else in the world where they have two-way interaction in real time with very little latency. So this is how the hologram is captured. You can see there's a green screen behind me. And then this is what an audience could potentially see. Me on stage anywhere in the world. Clients come to us for a number of reasons. One is obviously trying to get people to meetings that they can't get to otherwise, but a growing number of people are coming because they're looking to reduce their carbon footprint. I don't think it's something you're going to be using to visit grandma anytime soon. This tech expert says while holograms may not be accessible to everyone yet due to cost, he believes the demand for different ways to connect will rise, especially during and after the pandemic. We've been living online for a year and a half at this point. And we're looking for a different sort of connection to one another. So this technology is speaking to that. In what ways do you think this technology still needs to grow? Well, I mean, it'd be great if I were seeing you as a hologram as well. But, uh, you know, we're probably the smallest scale hologram company out there in terms of the footprint we actually need to pull this off. And so, you know, the smaller and smaller we can make that, the more accessible it is to everyone in the world. Let's do a little COVID bump out here. And we'll beam him out. Coming to you from the future, Tally Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. That is Whoa, so Oh cool. man, that was wicked. <laughs> Sorry, I got really excited about that. Did, Anyways, yeah. Am I not supposed to be here? No, you weren't supposed to be done. here, yeah. That's right. really neat. That's kind of like what Ashley does with the green screen, but uh, yeah, it looks really real. Yeah, it was futuristic. That's mm -hmm. cool. Can't wait to try it out.
Time for a look at the long range and uh, Ashley, you're going to look ahead to Thursday. Ida is on the way. Uh, what can we expect there? Yeah, we've got some pretty uh, active weather, I guess, over the next couple of days, certainly as we get into the last official long weekend oh, of the summer. Oh, it I hurts. know, <laughs> I know it hurts. Uh, it went fast, but let's take a look at Thursday's forecast. We'll jump right into it. Uh, it is looking like we're going to see some of those cooler temperatures return into the teens through central high teens pretty much for the west and eastern areas and then even warmer down along southern areas of the island. Marystown looking at 23 degrees for your Thursday. Uh, it is going to stay unsettled. That chance of showers will continue for most. We may see a few peaks of sun, but overall it will be a gray day. And then up across Labrador, you're looking at uh, the unsettled conditions for the west. Sunshine for Nain and back up to about 12 degrees. So all eyes really are on the remnants of Ida. Uh, as we head through the day on Thursday, we'll track through the maritime provinces and then eventually Thursday night. Uh, depending on the timing, we may see some showers a little bit earlier Thursday, but overall it looks like Thursday night is when we'll see that big push of moisture, some heavy rain uh, for Friday morning for the West Coast as well as the southern areas of the island. But most of us will be seeing rain at some point on Friday and then continuing. It looks like at least through the first half of Saturday. Eventually we'll see things clear out or at least get better improve as we get into the rest of the long weekend. So here's some early indications of rainfall projections right now. A good chunk of the island will see somewhere or could see somewhere between 30 to 50 millimeters. In excess of that, certainly not out of the question either, uh, but this is early indications. We'll also see some pretty gusty winds with this one as well. West Coast, South Coast uh, will likely see gusts in excess of 60, 70, maybe even 80 kilometers per hour uh, through the day on Friday and continuing on Saturday. So right now temperatures looking uh, like they will sit in the teens for the most part. They may jump up a little bit. We'll see that bigger push of warm air uh, Friday night into Saturday. That's when we'll see the warmest air and also the return of that humidity as well. Uh, temperatures across Labrador on Friday uh, looking fairly nice. 15 degrees uh, for Lab City under a mix or other sunny skies rather. And then as we look at the long range forecast for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland, you're looking at uh, that warm up, like I said, on Saturday, uh, but it is going to stay unsettled. Clearing skies as, as we get into Sunday and the rest of the weekend at this point. Similar forecast for both central and western Newfoundland with your temperatures dipping a little bit as we get into Sunday. And then for eastern Labrador, sunshine right through Sunday, a return of some of those uh, showers for you in Lab West. I had to share this photo. Flat, calm, and Bonavista Harbor doesn't happen too often. Wayne knows where worthy shared that shot. You have any weather photos? Send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Gorgeous. Great shot. Love when you see the mirror image there. Mm. <laughs> That's That's a beauty. <laughs> now, I don't know if you were here for this, Ashley. I don't think you were. Um, but you might find it hard to believe. But it was four years ago, yesterday, that the ghouls was swept up in Chase the Ace Fever. People spend hours in line to buy tickets for a chance to win more than $2.5 million. Yes, I remember it well. Uh, folks <laughs> packed in shoulder to shoulder, everyone clutching their tickets, hoping their number would be called to chase the ace. And it is... Oh, the ace! Oh, the ace! You can hear the excitement in our colleague Arianna Kellen's voice as the ace was drawn that night. Yes, with August coming to a close, we wanted to take a look back to when the Goulds was the hottest place in the province. Back in 2017, a massive chase the ace drew tens of thousands of people to the St. John's suburb with all eyes on the more than two and a half million dollar jackpot. So it started out as a modest, small fundraiser for St. Kevin's Church, but it grew and grew and grew and grew <clears throat> until lineups and people were all over the ghouls hoping to win all that money. Yeah, the community was hosting a regatta-sized party every week, an event that ran for 44 weeks straight without a winner. The biggest, uh, the biggest winner was St. Kevin's Church, who took home nearly $6 million thanks to that fundraiser. 
So it was actually Marge and Don Gorman of Conception Bay South did win that $2.6 million. But that was uh, that was a fun time. It was. And Ashley, you weren't here for that. You, oh, you no, but I remember it. Here? Yeah. Yeah, I remember it was all over. Even I was up in Yellowknife and we heard about it. So there it was, you go. It was international yeah. news, I believe. Yeah, for sure. It was amazing. <laughs> I still have my Ghoul's Rule shirt, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> You the ghoul again. <laughs> well, that's it for us, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope to see you tomorrow. Good night.